Geist, uh, a lot of news to cover other than North Korea, other than France, including an election out in Arizona that was a lot closer than both sides thought. Yeah, deep red district in Arizona has some Republicans kind of scrambling this morning. Debbie Lesko kept the seat vacated by Congressman T Trent Franks in Republican hands, but her five-point margin of victory pales in comparison to President Trump's 21-point victory in the district in 2016 and Mitt Romney's 25-point win in 2012. This despite a surge of outside Republican money to save that seat. Joining us from Glendale, Arizona, MSNBC correspondent Vaughn Hilliard. Vaughn, good to see you this morning. So this was expected to be a relatively close race, relative because the district has been so deep red for so long, but perhaps even closer than many Republicans thought it would be. Yeah, Willie, I spent more than a month there in Alabama getting, following Doug Jones, the Democrat, his ultimate victory to a, a Senate election there. Followed PA 18, Connor Lamb. This, Willie, though, I've got to tell you, I actually grew up just down the road, just outside of the district lines here. And if somebody had told me a mere three years ago that I'd be returning to Arizona to cover a congressional race, a close congressional race in Trent Frank's district, he's the congressman that resigned this winter, I'd have to ask you what happened to this country, what happened to the Republican Party, and what we we saw here over the last several days is a district that was really the backbone of Sheriff Joe Arpaio's reign in this state for more than a quarter of a century. Jan Brewer's rise. This was an area that is about 80 percent of the voters were 55 plus. But just like over in PA 18, where you had conversations with people, coal miners, they were saying coal miners' pension benefits were the driving issue for them. You go around here and you talk to independents and talk to Republicans, and what did we constantly hear over the last week? It was education. Teachers here are going to be walking out tomorrow from classrooms and when it comes down to it Hero Tipperini the Democrat we say you know talk about whether she fit the district or not she spoke to the issue that was most prominent here in this district well Debbie Lesko tried to run more as the the, the Trump or running on the Trump agenda I want to play you sound with three Republicans that we talked to here just before the polls closed what party are you registered how do you usually vote I'm registered as a Republican you usually vote Republican yes this selection you I voted, voted for Democrat. Pepperoni is looking for change, and we need it. And we need to make a future for our children here in Arizona and have good schools for them. And we won't have that if we keep up in the same road that we're on now. And that's a big reason you voted for the Democrat today. Yes. Why vote for Hero Tipponini? I felt like she was more forthright in uh, the program she wanted to support in education. Uh, Lesko seemed more of a Trump supporter than. Uh, one who wanted to go to Congress to get things done. You're a Republican. You said I, education is yes, an important issue. Absolutely. The most important. Education. Education is our future. And if we're not number one here in the state of Arizona, there needs to be a change. As a Republican, you're concerned. Absolutely. You guys, what I'll take away from the conversation here over the last week is much like conversation I had with two of the Parkland students, Alfonso and Charlie, who said that it was time for them to be the ones negotiating on gun control reform. What you heard from those Republicans, they're saying that we, teachers, educators, we're the ones that now need to begin uh, negotiating these deals ourselves. Well, in 2016, the country elected the, the so-called populist candidate. What you're hearing are moderates, Republicans, taking this situation into their own hands. And as we saw last night, saying that just because you're a Republican isn't good enough to get our vote. Willie? Vaughn Hilliard, who's been all over that race and all the special elections this year. Great coverage. Thanks so much, Vaughn. Good to see you. Bob Costa, uh, Steve Israel said earlier on the show there have been a lot of canaries in the coal mine for the Republican Party, but this might be the loudest one. Strong reporting there from Vaughn. And what, another point to add about this Arizona district is that Trent Franks was dogged by the, a sexual harassment scandal right. that forced him from office. So just like in that Alabama race, you have Republican candidates dealing with personal controversy as well as this coming potential Democratic blue wave. But you are seeing it's not just in the Rust Belt, in the Midwest, and, and those areas that President Trump did well in in 2016, but it's also the Sun Belt in the Southwest of the country where suburban voters, because of issues like guns, are starting to turn if you look at certain polls. You know, uh, Bill Crystal, you also can look at, I mean, this is obviously, a, as Vaughn said, just a rock ribbed conservative district or a total Republican district. You can also look deep south, though, Tennessee. The, the Democrats are ahead in 
Quite a few polls in the Tennessee Senate race. Mississippi, much closer than anyone expected. Alabama, obviously, elected a Democrat. Um, a lot of uh, Republican congressmen uh, in South Florida are going to be facing uh, some tough challenges. Uh, this this potential blue wave is going, it seems right now at least, to be going deep into the heart of Trump country. Yeah, I think so. And I think just analytically right now, the chances of Republicans losing the Senate are greater than the chances of Democrats not taking the House. That is, I think the chances of Democrats winning both houses are pretty good now. The Senate's more complicated because there are all these pro-Trump states with Democratic incumbents. But this is a big, I mean, there was no scandal in this race. There was a pretty good Republican candidate. Uh, she had plenty of money. She had more money than the Democrat. Uh, and, and they still underperformed by so many, <clears throat> excuse me, by such a margin that if that were translated across the country, the Democrats would easily win the House. And then I think Senate seats, as in Arizona itself, that's a, that's a district that Republicans seem to win pretty big to hold Arizona at the Senate level. If this it replicates itself, it's dangerous for them. And it is kind of, it was kind of a generic race. There was no way more scandal. There was no particularly bad candidate one way or the other. Both candidates had plenty of money. Um, so I, I think it's very bad for Republicans. It, it, it strengthens my view that this election day will be big in, a, in its own right. It's obviously important if Democrats win the House and or the Senate. It changes the dynamics for the next two years. But the day after election day for Republicans, something you and I have talked about a lot, Joe, is very important. That's the moment where Republicans stop justifying the vote in 2016 for Donald Trump. They stop justifying working with Trump over the last couple of years, Gorsuch, the tax cuts, whatever, whatever one thinks of that. And they have to confront the issue. Do you want to renominate Donald Trump for four more years? Are you, are you confident enough that this is going well, that you're going to sign on for another term? You can't do anything about the fact that he's president, so maybe you have to work with him. That's been the you know, general Republican attitude. I think the day after Election Day, things change more than people realize in terms of Republican psychology and dynamics. So you think, Bill, really these Republicans who have been so no. criticized on Capitol Hill for not crossing Donald Trump will wake up this November and all of a sudden turn on him? Well, they'll need a little help from people <laughs> like me and from, you know, I see other beginning outside group. I'm doing my, yes, yes. No, no, but I, I think it really changes partly because it becomes a prospective choice. For, for now, it's all been, oh, Bill, you're too, t you know, why are you being, he's president, what do you want to do? We have to work with him, we have business to do with the administration, and I understand some of that. The policy uh, decisions are okay, and Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. He won. He's president. He has the magic sauce. Was he won? Where McCain and Romney lost? I think you would agree with this. And this has been such a big deal for Republicans, right? It's like he miraculously pulled this inside straight and won the presidency. Suddenly they lose one or both houses. And again, they really have to confront the prospective choice suddenly on November seventh, twenty eighteen. Well, what do you want? I mean, he's president for the next, unless he's impeached, for the next two years. But are you comfortable with another four years of this cra level of craziness and chaos? You don't have to agree with Bill Crystal and think it was always a, a mistake. You can say that it was reasonable to try to disrupt things, drain the swamp, have, make, you know, bring change much better than Hillary would have been. But going forward, isn't there a better alternative? So I think, assuming Republicans do poorly, which I think they will on November 6th, I think the, the current notion that oh, Trump's unchallengeable in the Republican Party, he's got an 83% approval and all that, I think that could change pretty fast. But, you know, we kept hoping that all along. I mean, this is a conversation we've been having for almost three years now with Trump. What I wonder is, after the midterm elections, with Republicans, is do they double down on trying to be having these conservative mm -hmm. primaries, going forward, trying to play to that base and probably potentially losing and going to the abyss for a while, or do they come back and say, we have to do what's right for our districts, we have to have where moderates are needed, we put in moderates, we go against the president where necessary. It's going to be a very difficult choice for a lot of these Republicans to make, and it will lead to a lot of infighting, especially on the House side when we know Speaker Ryan's stepping down. Being minority leader is no fun, and being minority leader of this conference, of the Republican conference, the way it's looking, will just be a nightmare. But, but with Trump at the top of the ticket in 2020, they are kidding themselves. They're smoking something if they think they can come. But a large come. part they of say, they think they can distinguish themselves. themselves from Trump at that point with him on the ballot. Good luck. So I think you're right, but I think the, as the logic of things seeps in, they realize it's not enough for them to say some nice things about education or gun control. They have to confront the question, are they comfortable with Donald Trump going forward, renominated by their party? Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube, and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories, and you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.